This is Viterbi Voices, your chance to hear stories about research, classes, student life, and more. Directly from our students, faculty, and other members of our engineering community. All right here at the USC Viterbi School of Engineering. Welcome back into Viterbi Voices. Uh, once again, and as usual, I am your host, one of your hosts. My name is Paul Ledesma. I'm the Director of Undergraduate Admission at the USC Viterbi School of Engineering. And my name is Audrey Roberts. I am a senior studying mechanical engineering here at USC. Well, you know, Audrey, we, we uh, got a great episode today. This is, well, you, why don't you tell them who we got on? Because you arranged this. Sure. Thing. This was yours. <laughs> Um, so today we have an episode with uh, Professor Radovich, who um, is a faculty member in the Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering Department. Um, and currently he did his undergrad and graduate master's PhD here. So he's been here for a while, um, but he's obviously a professor here now. So currently he's teaching AME 341A, which is Mechoptronics Laboratory. Um, so it's sort of a notorious class here at USC amongst Infamous. us. Yes. Yes, amongst uh, mechanical engineers, aerospace engineers, and astronomical engineers. I'll take it. Um, but Professor Radovich is also sort of a legend. Uh, students love him. He teaches a lot of stuff. So it's uh, super fun to have him, on, have him on the podcast, and I think one of our primary goals in talking to him was seeing, um, you know, how are you teaching a class like Mechatronics, uh, which is a really lab-based class. You have a three-hour-long lab every week where you're really doing a physical experiment online, um, and they've done a lot of super innovative things with this class to keep it hands-on, so we talk a lot about that. Um, and just about his background, too, I think he has a lot of really great insight for students, especially as someone who went to USC as an undergrad and, and took these classes. Yeah, so uh, just add a little bit to that intro. He got his bachelor's in aerospace engineering, his master's in aerospace engineering, and his PhD in aerospace engineering, all from USC, continued on to teach. He's taught throughout the entire undergraduate curriculum with, he's, at some point in his career, he's always taught the intro class, statics class, flight mechanics class, the mechatronics laboratory, the senior project laboratory, undergraduate design projects, directed research. Basically, at one point, you could have, you could have had Dr. Radovich every single year as you went through your undergraduate degree in aerospace or mechanical engineering. So he is uh, the man when it comes to aerospace mechanical <laughs> engineering, as we talk about in this. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a fantastic episode. Uh, really dives in not only to kind of him and his background, the ideas related to these disciplines, but as, as Audrey mentioned, how he in particular is dealing with trying to take a very hands-on course and keep it hands-on in the pandemic. So I don't want to have any spoilers. Let's just get out of the way, get you right into uh, Dr. Charles Radovich. Yeah, yeah, one of, that's probably a great place to start is introduce yourself. <laughs> sure. All right, everybody. I'm uh, Charles Radovich, Associate Professor of Engineering Practice um, in the Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering Department. I have taught a handful of courses from uh, intro to aerospace engineering, a AME 105. It's our freshman level course for aeros, um, uh, statics, AME 201, so AME 309 fluids. And uh, right now I'm teaching AME 341A, so Mechatronics Laboratory, and I've taught that several times before. I also have taught uh, senior projects, AME 441. And aside from that, I really like to involve myself with design teams. I am the faculty advisor for the Aero Design team, as well as a co-advisor for another group called Aspen. Uh, but in general, if there's design team activity and I can help out, I like going to the reviews, walking around their labs, and and uh, interacting with those types of efforts. So what it basically comes down to, for those of you that aren't on campus or that, that know Professor Radovich, He's basically involved in everything in the aerospace and mechanical <laughs> engineering department, if you didn't pick up on that. It's, it's huh. courses from, from the first year all the way through, lower division, upper division coursework. It's, he's, I know you're definitely involved in undergraduate curriculum, and I mean, we've had separate meetings on, on, those, on those topics. I mean, a lot of people don't understand that administratively. Uh, and the design groups and the student organizations, I mean, you, you're... You're the department, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a stretch, but 
um, from the undergraduate side, for sure, I try to be involved however I can. And uh, I've been a faculty advisor for ASME, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Um, if there's a professional event being hosted by NSBE or AIAA, any of those groups, I'm happy to participate. And I just like getting to know our students because I want to know where they're trying to go and how I can help them get there. And everybody has such a different, um, you know, background and set of ambitions here at USC. Uh, getting to know them is really the only way I think I can be effective to, to, to get them there. Well, I'll add this. You, you wouldn't say it, uh, but I'll, I'll say it for you. Uh, just for everyone listening, you, as a faculty member, you don't do all those things and you don't get involved unless students want you to and they like you. <laughs> uh, you know, Professor Radovich is a well-liked faculty member, and I think when any conversation comes up about aerospace mechanical engineering, a student's first response is, "Well, let's talk to Radovich. Let's 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 figure that one out." So, just so you know, uh, you know, you are beloved, and 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 it, well, it's well nice, nice to hear. Thanks, and really, it's my pleasure. Yeah, it's great. it's great. Audrey, would you concur? I'm, I'm speaking on yes. behalf of your peers. I can, I can echo that from the student perspective. So I've never had a class with Professor Radovich, but you're, I hear about how amazing your classes are. And uh, actually just yesterday, uh, he helped us a bit on our senior design project, which he's not teaching this year, but cool. we were struggling. So thank you again. <laughs> Proving the button. Proving the button. Well, yeah. Why don't you start us off, of Professor Radovich, with um, your background, uh, you know, where, where, where did you come from and, and, and how yeah. was your academic journey like? How did you find yourself? Sure, here? yeah, born and raised in Las Vegas, Nevada, and not a lot of engineering going on there. And, you know, I even remember... Not a lot searching. of people born and raised in Las Vegas either. That, not a lot of... That you hear that, born and raised <laughs> That's in right. Vegas. Yeah, I remember searching for, uh, you know, engineering jobs in Las Vegas once, and engineering is like main, maintenance and... Um, making sure hotels are operational it's not you know it's it's not f-18s or f-22s or launch vehicles there's there's just not a ton of those opportunities so uh, came to USC as naive as one could be about what engineering could be and uh, certainly had no idea what it would turn out to be for me uh, but I was just interested in aerospace and uh, figured I'd give that a shot uh, it took took me a couple years to to figure out why I was here. Like I really knew what I liked at that point, just took a lot of exposure and experiences to kind of to discover what was out there and what I liked. Uh, it turned out wind tunnels was one of my you know, first loves of engineering and, you know, sticking huh. airplanes and space vehicles and, you know, um, you know, launch vehicles in a wind tunnel just to get their aerodynamic performance figured out. Was, you know, that was something I needed to do. And so, I had a lot of opportunities on uh, as a graduate school uh, graduate student as an undergraduate student to experiment there also got to do some industry work um, and uh, yeah that was that kind of work was happening while I was in graduate school and you did your uh, undergrad and your grad degree at USC yeah that's right yeah all three of them um, you know I was I was on a hot streak I really had momentum and I had <laughs> I had funding and I had um, opportunities that I was interested in. So it was, you know, I always oftentimes say it was, it was a lot of good luck and a lot of good timing. Um, every now and then someone reminds me that I, I was always very transparent in what I wanted to do and what I wanted to be involved in. And I was always around uh, to assist with research or whatever it might have been, which led to a lot of these opportunities seemingly being, you know, magic timing. But, you know, I was just without even thinking about it, positioning myself to, to, to continue to, to learn and experience aerospace engineering. So what was it about wind tunnels that automatically just like flipped a switch on you? Like all these things that happened, you, you specifically say it was wind tunnels. Yeah, it was wind tunnels. I was a, I was a junior and I was taking mechatronics, which I'm teaching you know, now. Uh, we had an experiment at the same time I was taking another course, which dealt with a lot of the same principles and it was an area that just snapped for me. I, you know, fluid dynamics was just like, I get it. And I was super interested in it. And it was one of those first fields too, where I could look at it on the surface and immediately identify what I didn't know about it. And that was so interesting and I wanted to learn more. And so I, I just started attaching myself to wind tunnels, however possible. If, if there was a, my senior design project was going to be involved with the wind tunnel. My graduate research was going to be involved with wind tunnels. I started doing 
490 courses, which are directed researches. So it's in, instead of taking normal courses, I was, how do I do more wind tunnel research? And uh, <laughs> now was just try to get everything I could out of it. That's fantastic. Now, you're one of the few faculty members that we have that did their undergrad at USC. And so this is a, a pertinent question. Why did you choose USC? How did you come to that uh, conclusion? Uh, as a student, like, wh why did I come here? Yeah, from high school. Yeah, come yeah from school. high school. Um, you know, I, did, I looked for, uh, I looked at a handful of institutions, and I can't say this too loud. I was a Notre Dame fan growing up, <laughs> and uh, uh, which which kind of naturally puts USC on the radar as well. Yeah. And um, you know, one of my best friends was applying here, and and at the end of the day, I got into both both of those locations. Uh, this one was obviously a lot closer and, and, and my sweetheart was in Las Vegas. So it seemed like a, <laughs> it'd be better to stay a little local and, you know, both schools had the same amount of brick, you know, they look as nice. Um, you know, both had very similar types of uh, uh, histories and, and, and at the time I thought similar student bodies, but I think the, the type of student at USC is, is a little bit different. Um, I think we're really, known for having multifaceted students and you see that with our uh, engineering plus or the number of students that have minors or double majors or just are involved with things not related to engineering but that's what makes them who they are is they're just interested in so many different things and at, at the end of the day i couldn't have been happier that i got you know so lucky to pick this place and i feel incredibly um, fortunate to be able to continue to teach these types of students which trust me, is a much, much better version of student than 20 years ago when I came in as an undergrad. <laughs> you guys are fantastic. And I, yeah, you, you and me both. You're one of the other few faculty members. I think Mark Redekop was the other one we had on last year, where you, me, Mark Redekop, uh, or basically you and Mark Redekop were both at USC while I was at USC. And so we never, I don't think we ever passed uh, across paths in undergrad, unless you, unless you can tell me otherwise. And I'm sorry if I, if I did anything wrong. <laughs> no, but coincidentally, I had a friend in class, an undergrad named Paul Ledesma, who is also from Las Vegas. <laughs> no kidding? Yeah, no kidding. Oh, wow. I, I don't think I think I don't think he completed here. I think he did two or three years here. But yeah, forever. And when I first saw your name come by way uh, of an email years ago, I was like, look at your photo. I was like, okay, not the same guy. <laughs> Yeah, that wasn't me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, good. What did what did what was your undergrad? What were your undergrad years like at USC? What were you involved in? Um, was I involved in uh, my first couple of years? I was working, and so that was like outside. So that took up most of my free time. And mm -hmm. um, the advice I give to students, based on my experience from that, is is figure out how to live as broke as possible and not work because I didn't realize it until my third year. I was missing out on a lot of the. Yeah. The, the student experience and um, that little money I had to eat, you know, steak, I started turning into ramen, <laughs> you know, once I said, okay, I'm not going to work anymore. Uh, that allowed me to just develop better study habits, meet and uh, get involved with organizations like the air design team, um, actually go to those football games and uh, basketball games and just start to, you know, get to know my professors, engage in some research as well. And, and it was all those things I was kind of not able, not able to squeeze into a, a, a standard work week or even a non-standard extreme work week because I just didn't have the time initially. But, but yeah, stayed pretty, got by the time I was junior and senior year, I really hit my stride and I was, it was involved with, you know, AIAA, Air Design Team, just anything that was out there I was, I was able to contribute to. That sounds good. And then uh, with teaching at USC, uh, obviously you've you've now been you know involved in the university in, in some regard over twenty years. Uh, and there's been lots of changes, uh, lots of differences. You mentioned the, 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 that's how we started this was that it's a different place than twenty years ago. Um, and do, do you think do you think it has to do mostly with kind of the multifaceted nature that you talked about with students, or is that just a generational thing, or is there something relative to the university? Do you think? Uh, I think the university has tried to make some strides in terms of the the, the people that are going to define this campus. Uh, there's probably some generational aspects too. And, you know, like I, I notice our students are uh, way more cavalier than 
than my generation seemed to be. A, a lot, in my days, it was a lot more of the playing it safe, afraid to fail. Uh, and this generation just seems like, let's break something because I've never experienced it before. And they just are really seeking the experiences. Um, that's something I don't recall being commonplace uh, when I was an undergrad. Yeah. This is also the part where I apologize to Audrey, where we talk about being old and <laughs> in old, olden days. And so. <laughs> it's okay. It's, it's good to hear. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, what uh, you te- you mentioned a lot of classes. Uh, I didn't I didn't capture them all down, but uh, one of them in particular was uh, 105, the intro course. Can can you tell us a little bit more about that intro course and what uh, an incoming student in aerospace mechanical engineering would would come to expect from that class? Uh, yeah, so I, I taught it for the first time, um, was it two years ago? And uh, th- that was really cool because you see what USC is all about at that point where I've got, you know, 30 people in a classroom and the ranges of experiences and the places from all over the world, the full spectrum is there. And so that makes it kind of interesting to teach because you have to keep everyone engaged. Um, but we quickly start to develop that team and community nature. And you realize that everyone is there to help each other. Um, you know, there's a little project that they have for building a glider and predicting the performance and demonstrating the performance. It really starts to bring everyone together. But so in terms of the course experience, there's some hands-on nature. Uh, we start applying and using mathematics probably uh, much more than anyone it would have in high school. Uh, it's not just numerical base, but these are physical things that we're using our math for. So in my opinion, it turns out to be a lot more fun and a lot of opportunities to test and break things and see, you know, how well those equations actually fit as a model. Yeah. And and as uh, going on to that, uh, this idea of aerospace and mechanical engineering, it's, it's one department at USC. There's a lot of overlap between these disciplines and, and also with astronautical engineering. Uh, yeah. and, and this is something that's a common question. We always try to get as many perspectives on this as possible. Uh, as possible. What are the differences between mechanical aerospace and astronautical? And specifically, should someone even be worried about these differences in the undergraduate level? I would say definitely don't be worried about it. I know a lot of students are hesitant to go aero because they feel like it's going to specialize them. Uh, it's going to be two or three courses where they can go a little bit deeper into flight mechanics or fluid mechanics. Um, compared to a mechanical engineer might go deeper into structural dynamics or vibrations or something like that. But the, the overall foundation uh, is all the same. Um, so you just figure out the course plan that's going to be the most exciting to you. Uh, this might be the only opportunity you have to take an advanced flight mechanics course. So figure out you know how to make that part of your schedule. Um, and at the end of the day, you're going to position yourself for whatever job you want because the real skill set you should be developing is of, of that of a problem solver. And if you can demonstrate you're a problem solver in an interview, it doesn't matter if you have a history background or a, you're, you're a civil engineer major, you'd be able to get whatever job you want. Well, there's a little more math in your aerospace engineering degree than a history major, correct? So a little more physics, a little more stuff like that. So I wouldn't say maybe that, but... <laughs> I've seen it, <laughs> but okay. but it was a stretch, yeah. <laughs> one of the one of the best structural designers uh, and uh, people I've worked with in industry was, he was like, really, your history major? You know, oh, really? Like, yeah, cool. yeah, I've, I've seen it. And uh, uh, sure, that's not the norm, but, but I think ultimately from that... You, just think about this place as, as, as an opportunity to just learn and go further in whatever areas interest you. And you're going to have a very similar foundation as any aero, mechanical, astronautical engineer, and you'll still be in a position to, to, to get the job that you're interested in. Well, and as you talk about foundation, you mentioned a little bit about this, this mix between theoretical learning and hands-on learning and how that, that, that's right in the beginning. And, and I know that that's that persists throughout the undergraduate education. Can you talk about the importance of balancing out theory and hands-on in the undergraduate? Yeah, boy, the, the hands-on part is, in my opinion, really where it all connects. And it's it's very difficult to figure out what matters and doesn't matter from just staring at an equation. So that hands-on experience, when you're actually building something in a lab and this much adhesive or this much or what if the edge is cut like this or that does it really matter 
Um, it's just something you gain from experience and that, pra you know, from practice and that, that practical knowledge is what allows you to be a better problem solver when you're, say, in grad school or industry and something's thrown at you, you can quickly say, that doesn't matter, that doesn't matter, this is the part we need to focus on, or this is the part I've never done, and it's going to need all my attention before all those other things come, you know, in, into light. Audrey, so, have you, yeah. have, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, so, yeah, so, so the classes offer some of that, you know, there's always a lot of lecture that goes with the course, even a lab course, um, and so the better way to jumpstart your hands-on practical experiences with our design teams or with getting involved with any sort of research. Uh, have you found that uh, true, this idea of, of learning a little more of the, your problem-solving skill set from the hands-on or something that you assumed would go a certain way in theory and then <laughs> you had to make some adjustments? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, I think absolutely. For me, I'm a super visual person, so like I can't really understand anything until I do it. And I think... Um, that's one of the cool parts about um, Mech Ops AME 341, uh, which Professor Radovich is teaching right now, is because basically every um, experiment, every report is based on comparing what your theoretical prediction is to what actually happens when you collect your data. And oftentimes those do not align. And I think the cool part in the learning really comes when you understand why they're not the same. Um, and I think, uh, Mac Ops kind of has a rap for being a hard class that we all complain about a lot. And I definitely did bit. that. <laughs> yeah. I definitely did that. But um, you learn a ton because you're really driving. Um, yeah, I mean, you kind of have to figure it out on your own, figure out why your data doesn't match up and write it down. So that's how you learn. Think about this. I was the student just like you were. And you bet when I took the course, I was, you know, this course. And, and then I got an internship that summer and within like two weeks, I was like, that class was right. Everything about <laughs> it was right. And, and anything they wanted me to do, I could do it. And oftentimes we're surprised They're like, Oh, you could handle it. Like, yeah. <laughs> You're like, what's the big deal? And it wasn't because of, you know, most of my lecture courses, it was all about learning how to figure things out. And uh, that, becoming a problem solver is what we really try to, to, to get through with that course. So I, I do like the talk of Mech Ops. Mech Ops is the one class that I hear the most of because there's people that talk about it before they're about to take it. They talk about it while they're <laughs> in it and then they talk about it afterward. Uh, and then they only stop talking about it when they all realize that same situation. Oh, damn it. I did need that. <laughs> <laughs> they, are, they are right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it, I mean, it's a hard course to take. Trust me, it's a hard course to teach uh, with lab going four days a week. I just had a three hour to the minute, you know, jam packed staff meeting to prepare for next week. Oh, wow. Uh, and it's a big machine. You know, we have a lot of faculty. Uh, we have two faculty. We have uh, five graduate TAs. We have uh, nine undergraduate lab assistants which are just essentially half-time TAs we have lab technicians that support this place and it's an experiment as experimental course I should say where things don't always go as planned which is why you did the experiment to get your data and, and figure things out so just preparing for all of that week in week out uh, it, 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 it's a challenging course you know, for all for all involved but I but I know the payoff I've experienced I've, I've seen and I know it's all worth it so it really is a lot of fun to teach it's just the, the new title of the course mechatronics everyone suffers even me <laughs> <laughs> even me we all suffer <laughs> yeah yeah i think i know i'm interested to to sort of hear obviously right now what we're we're looking at <laughs> is all online classes and i know um you've done some really interesting things to continue to make uh, Mac Ops an engaging sort of an experiment based class. So yeah, what does Mac Ops look like this yeah, semester? How do, you, how, do you do this? how do you do this in the pandemic? So it this is went online and uh, we scrambled for a little bit, you know, starting in March and we haven't stopped working since we <laughs> went home for spring break and like figuring out how we're going to plan the fall semester, right? So um, we were thinking of ideas and, and understanding that hands-on something is really what's going to make this most impactful. Um, and how do we still give our students a valuable learning experience 
And so uh, we thought of a handful of ideas and things we could do. We didn't want to just record lectures so people could watch them. We wanted to try and get them to experience however they could. And our one of our lab technicians, Jeffrey Vargas, uh, brought the idea that we can use our lab stations next door here and remote desktop into them. And those lab stations have all the expensive hardware, the stuff that we couldn't say, oh yeah, just imagine it's your textbook and spend three grand on this electronics box so we can do it, <laughs> right? That we, we couldn't do that. Uh, but all of our stations are uh, equipped with this type of stuff. So we, we set up a system where the students can remote desktop into our lab stations and they have full control. They can run function generators, they can run oscilloscopes, digital multimeters. The only thing they can't do is physically make those circuit connections on this side of the lab. So we do that for them. They're still able to operate and be in control of that experiment. Uh, but to, to give them the how to wire things up experience, uh, we assembled a hardware kit for everyone uh, and mailed it to them. And so the logistical efforts with 172 boxes getting shipped out this last uh, couple of weeks was exciting to say <laughs> the least, but, but we did it. And so now every student has a box at home um, or wherever they're at, and there's a breadboard in there. There's all the electronic components. Uh, we redid one of the labs. Um, they needed a power supply for it. So we sent them, you know, batteries. That's a power supply. Uh, we sent everyone a digital multimeter, a pair of calipers, essentially like an engineer's starter kit. And now they own these things, they'll have them forever. And so they'll make circuits. They won't be able to, one of the experiments, like I said, they'll be able to actually run at home. But some of the other stuff that requires more expensive equipment, they'll be able to assemble them. They're going to take a photo and we'll, we'll review that with them one on one and make sure they actually have the experience wiring circuits. But that equivalent circuit is going to be in the lab and it will be pumping, you know, a function generator through it. And so it, it's kind of bridging the gap of giving them the hard troubleshooting wiring aspects that come with, you know, how do I actually engineer and, and wire up instrumentation and do experiments. That's the part that they really need. So they're able to get that. Uh, we're able to, you know, correct if they if they weren't able to wire something or, you know, just teach them how breadboards work, all that kind of good stuff. And then they run labs and they get their own data. And yeah, it, it's interesting. We, we, we got to, we were fortunate over the summer, we had a summer course, which was nice, had 15 people, very manageable and uh, a great group of students that understood we were all in this experiment together. And uh, we worked out a lot of the bugs, um, how to share data on a screen, how, you know, we're learning how to zoom, you're learning how to zoom. Uh, how to log data, share it, how to use your camera to actually show stuff, you know, how to make sure you're not going clearly, you can see. Um, <laughs> but just, just ultimately how to, how to communicate precisely and technically through this format. Uh, so we got a lot of good practice with that, that the, those students were awesome at giving feedback and suggestions so we could uh, get this course on for the fall uh, implementation on the tracks. And so, yeah, here we are. Get so ready I, for uh, a, another lab next week. I think we might want to take a couple steps backward uh, because I just realized both of you two know what you're talking about. Um, and our listeners have no idea. <laughs> so let's start with what is Mechatronics? And what do you, like, pandemic aside, what is Mechatronics? And, and what, do you, what do you do in that class? Because it, it's a combination uh, of, of a lot of different skill sets related to engineering. That's right. It, and as the name implies, it's Mechoptronic, so mechanical, optical, electronic things all spliced together. Um, what we try to do for aeromechanical engineers is, is introduce them to the instrumentation that they're going to care about, like how to measure pressure, how to measure uh, temperature with thermocouples, how to measure strain with strain gauges. These are all like the very physical things aeromechanical engineers design and test um, and so we'll introduce them to that instrumentation, but uh, that'll be next semester for part B. Part A is understanding when you have this instrumentation and hook it up to some sort of electronic box, what that can do to your data, how it's digitized, how to make sure you don't mess it up in terms of how you sample it, how to make sure you're, you're not destroying the data that you have so you can actually do something with it useful. Um, so we're teaching them all the electronic aspects that their jobs are going to soon rely on and what makes mechop 
part A, this fall semester is so hard, I think, is AME means not EE, not electrical engineering. Right. Uh, but here we are, we have to guide them through the, the bare bones principles they need to know so that the physical things they want to measure later, um, you know, they can make sense of them. So we use a lot of circuits, we use a lot of breadboards. This is just wiring up instrumentation, getting it on a data acquisition system. So once the data comes in, we know if we should believe it and when we shouldn't believe it. And when things get say aliased or distorted, we'll know how to fix that problem. We're not just kind of stuck with whatever comes up on a screen. So you would create these experiments and using all of the, the cause you're in the lab right now, right? Or you're, you're in the floor uh, where you're, where yep. you're in, right? And so you've got all these these benches, oscilloscopes, function generators, multimeters, you hook everything up, people build the circuits or they, they build their devices, they run all their tests and out of there. Is the, is this uh, pandemic version of it where you've shipped out these boxes? Um, I'm, I'm assuming we're scaling down these projects or, or are they the same? We haven't scaled down really at all. Uh, there's one lab that was very physical that we omitted and uh, we also have a shorter semester, so right. uh, it would, we just kind of lost time where we could do that. But if, if you can see the board uh, in front of me, it's the list that we're starting that says 341B asterisk equals Friday bonus lab to get students up to speed. So we are keeping track of all of the little things that we're unable to instruct uh, because of this format. And uh, you can bet there's going to be some crash courses uh, to make sure everyone gets all the experiences that the, the 341A B sequence was designed for. Hmm. So, so, and so you guys, you guys have all been working. You've been shipping. Do you, do you ship out one box for the whole semester? Or are you shipping out as you go? With one once for the semester. Yeah, okay. it's quite a uh, quite an effort to get that. So, and then make sure they all get received. And yeah, and then the students that said, "Yo, yeah." I'm not home anymore. I'm on a road trip. And you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could make this stuff up. But yeah, um, the harder, the, I'll tell you the one that's, part. It's your fault, by the way, too, right? It's, it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, everyone's, I mean, hashtag, we're all in this together. Everyone's been <laughs> pretty, pretty flexible, understanding. Uh, this pandemic, you talked about earlier how the podcasts are intended to make us all more human. It's definitely making us all appear very human, you know, and kids run across the screen and there's yeah. always, it's just, you know, the nature of what we're doing. So, um, yeah, I was going to add something else to that, but anyway, I forget. So yeah, yeah, it's, it comes up. Yeah. Um, now, not that you should be, but are you teaching anything else? Uh, this is enough, right? Or you got more? Yeah, this, this is enough as a, as a lab course, it actually counts as being worth two courses. Yeah. Uh, because I mean, just add up the hours and it kind of exceeds that of two courses, but that's, uh, that's it. That's it for this semester, except I'm all, I am still a faculty advisor for those design groups, mm -hmm. uh, Aspen and Aero design team. And so uh, we still have our meetings. We're transitioning a little bit here as we figure out how to design and build planes if we can't be on campus right now. Yeah. Um, and so we've got some, a lot of design and analysis work that kind of closes out some summer projects. And uh, we're right at the point where we're going to have to transition to either full-on design uh, competition for this year or wait and see if phase three or four or any of that starts to allow some socially distanced lab work. It also depends on what the competition committee releases as a set of rules and how we have to adapt and, and uh, restructure our team to st still be able to compete. So. Yeah, we're figuring that out now. We expect our rules will be out in first week of September. So, huh. so design teams are in a lot of wait and see mode right now. Yeah, they're in a lot of wait and see mode. Um, I'm I'm trying to make sure they're not. I'm trying to give them something to. <laughs> yeah, well, like I I think it's best to assume the worst case. Yep. Because if tomorrow they said you can go to lab, they're going to figure out how to go to lab, and they'll be able yep. to say, okay, forget that. <laughs> let's let's build. Uh, but I'm really worried about waiting and waiting and waiting or having hope and getting let down and just having nothing. Yeah. And there's really a, there's a ton we can do in terms of design and analysis work. And, and that's a lot of what you do in industry. Also, you, know, you put together proposals and design reviews, 
uh, as an analyst, you're not typically building something in a lab. And sure, there's a lot we can learn from that here at this stage, but there's also a lot of technical uh, analytical work that will make them, you know, much better engineers. So there's stuff for us to do. Um, uh, we got an, a, an idea from uh, Blaine, uh, Blaine Rodden, who's one of the original faculty advisors for the team. So going back like 30 years, uh, but he's still involved with the team and he's actually involved with USC. He's taught um, an aircraft design course and works with the board of advisors. But anyway, he, he, uh, brought up an idea just like what I'm doing for Mechatronics. So I was laughing at why didn't I think of this? But he's like, why don't you guys assemble kits and send it out to, to design team members and they can build planes and do certain tests. I'm like, great <laughs> idea. And so that just came out uh, by, I just saw that email last night. And so the team's gonna work real quickly to, to start assembling things that we can design and test at home. And you know, you can imagine structural things like you know, wing boxes and fuselage designs, you can, you can mock up real aircraft structures with sticks and, and, and show how efficiently you can make a structure, which matters in aerospace because you can't just fly an infinite amount of weight. Uh, and then we can have little inter-team inter kind of competitions for you know, how fast things can go, how they can break, and still learn a lot about aircraft design and integration and all that good stuff. So. That's great. So I think there's actually some cool ideas that come from this that, you know. There are definitely, yeah, we, my colleagues and I were just talking about this, not that anyone listening cares, but th this idea <laughs> of like, you know, what we're, the, obviously there's challenges and opportunities and everything, and this this has put everybody on their on their heels a little bit when it happened, but now that we're settled into it, there's so many things that people are saying, like, why don't we always do it this way? Like, why, why can't we just... Like specifically, why can't I just be at home? <laughs> what I do. <laughs> That's the one right. that keeps coming up. Traffic has been fantastic, but I'll clarify. I'll take that traffic if I could be in contact with my students again. But yeah, the human contact is the one thing that we need. Um, but it, it is different. How, are you going to campus every day now? Because you have all these lab components and things. I, I, I've been sticking to three days a week. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And that's squaring away, it, it mostly for running lab or squaring away lab details. And yeah. you know the, the lab days I have, I need to be up here in case, you know, if, if it's only myself and my lab tech, and we have to troubleshoot the lab stations for the students that are remotely connected, we'll do that. Uh, but even our TAs are helping remotely, a lot of Zoom breakout rooms, human contact or is, it, we're trying to, is something that we want to address. So Zoom breakout rooms, a lot of one-on-one -on -one time, a lot of let's slow down, let's walk through this together. Um, once we get in the zone here, as we experienced over the summer, it's just like we're sitting there talking with the students. We're st they, I could stand over their, their workstation or we could all view it through sharing screens. We can both take control over the desktop and click buttons. And it's just like we're there, but we can't touch elbows, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> So um, what do you know of your colleagues and how they're handling their courses with these similar constraints and, and other types of innovative practices? Um, the, the one I've been in most contact with is senior design projects. That, that was the one that really took the, the biggest transformation. That's not like pre-potted or planned experiments, but each student typically would be given the opportunity to design, build, and test whatever they want. And um, uh, since we don't have that ability for them to be in lab to design and or to build and test things, that course had to transform to a much more um, um, analytical design effort and simulation based. And there's still a lot to, to do and learn over there. And you can experiment in the simulation world, similarly to how you could in the hands on world. That one took the biggest transformation, uh, you know, the, the probably the biggest back to the drawing board and figure out how we're gonna do this type of course. Aside, aside from that, the standard lecture courses, uh, I think are more or less on the tracks as they have been before. Um, probably some, some good thought experiments, experiments and in-home experiments coming out of it. I know like a fluid dynamics course, if I were teaching that, I'd have people experiment with their sink or milk or something like there's, there are <laughs> fluids in your house and you can learn some pretty cool things and demonstrate some things. So you definitely get scrappy, if you will, get creative though. And um, yeah, yeah, I, th I think more than anything, being technical, uh, we have Zoom figured out for the most part. So that isn't our barrier to entry. 
It's just how do we make the class a little bit more engaging? Um, for my students, I'm, I'm asking them, I'm trying to humanize, as you, as you put it, uh, to let them know I want feedback and I need feedback because we're all doing this that first go around together and if what how I'm delivering isn't working for you, you need to let me know now so we can fix this, right? So we don't have these in-class chats all the time. Open up your mic, turn on your camera, let's connect however we can. But but yeah, I'm certainly looking for some feedback from the students and you know, Audrey, I'd be excited to hear any suggestions you have for what's working and what not to do um, yeah. because otherwise I wouldn't hear it until November and it's too late, <laughs> right? I'll, I'll think about it. It's tough though because I think, I think we kind of feel this disconnect a little bit between um, professors and students. I think students since March have been like, oh gosh, like it kind of is a bummer to have everything online. But I think we don't think about, of course, professors feel the same way too. Like that's not... Uh, the same, but it sounds like um, I think at this point, one we're we're all we all kind of like you said, we know we're in this together, um, and we know it's kind of the way it is for now. Um, but it's cool for me to sort of see the evolution a little bit too, yeah. of like uh, me taking Mac Ops, of course, in person for a semester and a half, and then online for a half semester, and see kind of I feel like even hearing what it is now versus in the spring, like there's already been so much learning and how to make it more improved, more engaged, because in the spring, we only had a couple, it's a little different in the spring, but, you know, it was yeah. more of a video kind of thing, video and give the data, and then, uh, then we analyze it. And as soon as we started, too, I had another idea, and then it's like, ah, you know, I found this, you know, essentially electronics function generator suite for your phone. I'm like, well, you could turn your phone into a function generator, and I'm like, <laughs> Oh, but I have to try that out. What if we burn out everybody's phone? You know, it's like, all right. So, <laughs> so now I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to experiment with this on the side, but do I transform the course so that even if we're back in person, we still go with this you know, scrappy do it yourself engineer style, or do we drift back into using this professional expensive lab equipment or do we do a little bit of yeah. both? So, so I, I think some good things are going to come from this. Uh, it, but yeah, there's always ideas and ways to improve that I'm thinking of. So if, if there's some way more obvious or more pressing things that the students are saying, I, I want to know now, you know, so. Yeah. Well, Audrey, what's your, what's your experience been like, Audrey, with this senior project? Um, I, you, you, as we started the call, you said you were working on stuff and, and getting, getting uh, <laughs> Professor Radovich's help. Yeah, so we're just getting started, honestly, so I can't really speak too much to how it's going to work. But as Professor Radovich said, um, it's definitely shifted to kind of, peer, well, it, it's purely analytical, purely simulation based, um, which honestly, I think was disappointing for me and I think all of us, but we know we know that's how it has to be just, I think, kind of since freshman year, we're sort of looking forward to actually building something with our teammates and like, I'm working with the friends I made in AME one on one, right? So it's just kind of a bummer because you know we've been thinking about it for so long, and then now we're kind of um, not where we pictured ourselves. But I think it's a great opportunity, as again, as Professor Radovich was saying, to sort of get scrappy as an engineer, which I think is where you learn a lot. So it was sort of fun for us as thinking when we were thinking of like what kind of project would work in this setting, just to really throw out ideas maybe we wouldn't have if we had to build it in person, um, which maybe that's a bad thing, <laughs> but it's kind of, you know, fun, fun, I think from an ideation perspective, but yeah, I mean, we're going to make it work. Well, um, there's obviously a, like a great um, teaching staff and, and team to support us. I, we're not going to get the building experience, of course, out of it. And I don't think any of us are claiming we will, um, but I definitely think um, from a simulation and analysis perspective, you know, it's pretty open-ended. We can use whatever tools we want. Um, so we're going to learn a lot there. And that's uh, oftentimes how the real world works, too, because if you're making something uh, that's you're, – you're probably not building it yourself. So. so I think we'll learn something different from it, like how to be agile, how to deal with uncertainty, how to maybe uh, work through disappointment a little bit that we win it, that we win it in a normal year. Um, and maybe maybe those kind of soft skills uh, are more more valuable in the long run, honestly. So I've, I've kind of uh, swallowed the bummer of not being able to kind of build something, but I'm looking forward to, to learning something new from it. 
a long, yeah, long-winded I, answer, but. I think it's a great perspective to have and, and understand you're still gonna be able to get whatever you want out of this, right? And it's the same as the in-lab version. If you totally. didn't want to get something out of that, you wouldn't, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so now here we are with uncomfortable constraints or scenarios that we have to adapt to. And yeah, this is real world training at its finest. It, it really is. <laughs> um, so, and I think it's a great opportunity to, there are so many engineering tools. I think I've learned about this a lot more as I've gotten or, or as I've gone through my undergraduate degree and just internships and stuff. There's so many powerful software tools for simulation and analysis that are super hard. And this is like a great time to learn them. I know like I can think of like ANSYS or, or tools like that, that we don't typically learn in, in class necessarily because they're like ANSYS is like a, you can, you can run a bunch of simulations. I won't get into CFD <laughs> and stuff like that. But I, I think a lot of us are like, Oh, you know, USCS free Linda training. So all of us are kind of like, I can, I can learn ANSYS on the weekends, whether we do or not still, <laughs> Still TBD, but it's <laughs> um, cool. So, but yeah, uh, I, go ahead, Paul. Go ahead, Audrey. Oh, I was just gonna say, yeah, I think it's it's cool to have these conversations too, from students to professors, because I feel like last semester one of the the cool parts as we started to go online was sort of what Professor Radovich was saying. You know, we're both like kind of trying to figure it out. So I think all around, if you know, people get feedback, if people are there to support each other. It's gonna it's gonna work out. So the the question that I was gonna ask it, it, you've already kind of touched on a lot of this, uh, but in case anybody wasn't really kind of reading between the lines, what's what's your best advice to students that are going through this, uh, our incoming students or the, these these seniors in high school right now? Um, uh, you know, it is as you said, we're all going through it. We're all doing this together. So, what's what's your advice for students as they sit there and say? This is not how my senior year was supposed to go. This is not how my first year was supposed to go. Yeah. I, I think you, you've just got to start showing up in office hours the same way you would typically walk by just to say hi. And not everyone does that, but I wish they would. Like, we really love having conversation with students that has nothing to do with an assignment, right? We just want to talk about their interests and whatever it might be just to get to know them. Um, and so if particularly if, if you're a new student here, just throw yourself into random office hours. Ask a professor, hey, I saw your website. Can we chat? I'm new here. Just want to chat. And I've had a couple of those already. And I know it's just a couple and there's a couple hundred. And so uh, some of them, I think, are figuring this out and they're really getting a lot out of it. Uh, I am really worried about it's probably a third that you know, the third that wouldn't say anything in class or maybe wouldn't come by office hours. And I feel like those are the ones that are, that are really going to be at a disadvantage here because once we do get back in person, they're still going to have to go through that transient of, you know, getting to know us and they'll just be another semester behind. So uh, in terms of, of that type of development. And so, yeah, my advice is show up to lecture 15 minutes early. I turn my camera on 15 minutes early every day, hoping to talk about the Dodgers or something else, or just, <laughs> just chat it up with my students. Um, I try to make sure my lecture is done at the normal time for those that you know, are on a schedule, um, but I'm not in a hurry to shut my camera off after lecture. Um, office hours, I come and hang out. I've had people hang out for two hours, uh, is how long my uh, my office hour session is, and they're there for the full two hours every single day. And we've yet to talk about schoolwork. You know, it's 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 other things, the engineering related. Sometimes, other times, it's just life stuff. Um, but I feel like those are the ones that understand this is how they're going to get uh, what they should out of uh, a college experience. So you just got to throw yourself out there. Say hi. Well, let me know, uh, and I'll come hang out and talk to you. If, uh, <laughs> I want to talk to you because I, I got the time now. Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll always talk Dodgers with you. Although I'm sorry, I felt out of it when you, I, I was not. I was not able to answer your question when we started our oh, this this talk. So. <laughs> I'm in the same boat with you, though. Is as soon as it started, it was like, oh my god, live sports. I was all over it. Now I'm like, yeah, there was another game last night. I, was like, I can't. <laughs> 
Yeah, it would have, yeah, that first weekend, I was like, I'm watching every game. I'm watching every all pitch. I'm watching all of it. <laughs> Great. I'm in on it. And then I realized, like, oh, no, I can't keep up with this. I got <laughs> – And everything's it harder now, right? Everything takes more time now. I'm shocked that – I didn't watch a lot of games ever, but I started every morning or that night I, before I went to bed knowing what the score was. Mm-hmm. But now I'm like – Maybe on Saturday I'll see how the week went. <laughs> yeah. You know what I found is that it, I, I did most of those things, like the usual catch up on stuff, all in the commute. Or like That's you know, right. You listen to a podcast, you check out the app for this, read the headlines, do whatever you want to do. And and now I'm like, I, I don't I, I have to like physically sit down and make time to do it, which is really weird. Yeah, I'm with you. Funny because now I watch the Today Show every morning. She's like, "When did you become a Today Show fan?" I'm like, "I don't, but this I don't have a commute, so this I sit down. I, I, I listen to Savannah and Hoda give me some updates on stuff. Like that, that's it. That's what I got now. Don't get mad at me." She goes, "We well, gotta watch your stories, you old man." And I was like, "Fine, yes, I do." You're spot on. For us, it's like the nightly news is now like on our to-do list like yep putting on kcal nine or whatever and get the daily update and it's like we're new we're watching news like old people is right I like, we, <laughs> I know, it's like what are my parents for i'm like why are you watching nightly news it doesn't help you like just read the things that you're supposed to read and like dive in but now i'm like i'm all in this is this is how you do it <laughs> this is how you do it it's how you get caught up yeah yeah it's been that that part's been funny to watch i think that evolution been cooking a whole lot more that's for sure too what do you and cook? With it, I'll, I'll cook anything last weekend we went to hawaii i had a uh, lilo and stitch on the tv i did uh, hawaiian fried chicken and a hawaiian style macaroni salad all from scratch oh my gosh wow yeah, yeah. that was good I, I like cooking a lot of asian food you know like those spare ribs that you get two oh. of those and you want 20 of them yeah, yeah, yeah. I, fig- I figured out how to make the recipe so i got I can I can get twenty of those ribs when I want twenty of those ribs, <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, I like doing that. I'll, I'll cook, I'll cook anything. Boy, I, I even baked. This, this is how I, I never bake. I was even baking this summer. So. Wow, that that is a stretch. We we had an air fryer, and so I've been enjoying that. And so some mm-hmm. wings, uh, and then when we make burgers, we make French fries. It's like oh, this is amazing. I don't know how we ever lived without the air fryer. So it's it's, it's pretty awesome. French fries of all things, that's what we're missing big time. And so I, I, I tried the, the deep frying version. That's just such a mess and your house smells like, you know, a fryer. Uh, we should look into the air fryer. I the think. air fryer is fantastic. Quite literally chop up a potato, drizzle olive oil on it. It has this rotating basket and it just sits there for about 20, 15, 20 minutes and you're done. Amazing. This sounds life changing. Yeah. Life, restor- <laughs> life restoring, I should say. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. Well, um, I don't know. Did we ask all of our questions, Audrey, that we wanted to ask? Is it we missing? I anything? think so. I think a lot of them, Professor Radovich, just covered without, without us asking. So I think we did. appreciate oh, you. To yes. answer your question, uh, the doubleheader was yesterday. Dodgers beat the Giants both, t- both games. Yes. Good. So 7 0 blanked them on both. And they're playing the Rangers. <laughs> playing the Rangers at five tonight. So I like it when the Giants lose. Well, the, Dodgers, <laughs> the Dodgers have here's the ones that I did know because I was reading my headlines. Uh, the Dodgers have not lost a series this season. Yeah, I think they have the best record um, in the league as of like Wednesday or so. Come on, man. Just hope there's no cheetahs in the World Series and we can finally. <laughs> Finally hang another banner in that stadium. All of our Houston listeners. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> allegedly, allegedly. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Always, always love having you on. And uh, thanks for, for sharing the knowledge and for all the cool stuff that you're doing to, to get our students through this and, and to get that education as, as hands-on as possible. Yeah, my pleasure. And, and any time. So fight thanks on, everyone. Thanks, Professor Radovich. Fight on. Fight on. And welcome back. Now, you have never taken Radovich and you're in your senior year. No. So I think my freshman year, um, one of my good friends who is a year older than me in mechanical engineering, she was talking about like statics or something that she had with Radovich. It was like, oh, I love him so much. He's an amazing professor. Um, and it's like, oh, gosh, like I... I, I was taking statics like the next semester or something and I, he wasn't teaching at that semester. So I feel like every, 
every semester I've been like a semester behind, but whatever I've always, ro- whatever his rotation is, like you're just always totally. on, the, on the wrong level. <laughs> just, yeah. Somehow avoiding me. I don't know, but maybe that's what it and, is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, mean, I know, I think last year he taught senior design. So I was kind of hoping like, Oh, maybe senior design this year, but we still have great professors for senior design. So it's not, but I am I, maybe, well, honestly, I'm pretty much done, so I probably you're not gonna have them. Yeah, you were. I'm not gonna have them. When you're taking yeah. statics, he's teaching senior design. When you're taking mech ops, he's teaching statics. Like it just kind of goes all the way around. It's just yeah. yeah, it hasn't worked. But that being said, um, I kind of mentioned this at the beginning of the podcast. Um, I've never had a, a class with Professor Radovich, but just yesterday we had a quick Zoom call with him to ask some questions about um, some flight mechanics stuff for our senior design project. So I think that just really speaks to how involved he is with students um, mm-hmm. in general, you know, yeah. we're not in a class he's teaching and he still helped us out. So he's awesome. He's just a really nice guy. I mean, from an administrative standpoint, he's always basically one of our points of contact for the aerospace mechanical engineering department, very involved in the undergraduate curriculum, very involved in, in, in what we do in undergraduate admission, very supportive, both not only of students, but also of us and, and our efforts to enroll. Uh, and just someone that I know you all come to rely on, and I definitely come to rely on him a lot. So uh, it's just, you know, top to bottom, just just a fantastic guy. And, and I hope that all of you that are listening, that are thinking about aerospace mechanical engineering, I hope you're not like Audrey and that you actually get to take a class <laughs> one with Radovich. Um, so this is really cool. Uh, outside of that, you know, as you can tell, we recorded this whole thing across Zoom. Everything is still in our new normal, which is all remote. And we'll be that way for the foreseeable future. Uh, if you are a, a high school student that's looking at the application process, make sure that you check out our website, viterbiadmission.usc.edu. All sorts of links there to register for virtual events uh, and uh, upcoming chat sessions. And we'll, we're going to be working, working to book some faculty roundtable sessions in the coming weeks. You can sign up to be notified when we book those on our website. There's so much stuff happening. Make sure you engage with us. And and what I like about uh, it's a weird sense. What I like about this pandemic that's that's the wrong thing to say. I don't <laughs> like it anyway. What what I like about the circumstances that we're in right now is that we have so many new ways to connect with us without you leaving your home. And just in this admission process alone, we've got at least three events a week going on that you can attend any one of those. And um, there are more as we go throughout this whole. Uh, rest of the next next couple months of this application process. So if you're at all thinking about USC and the Viterbi School uh, and you're listening to this podcast, hey, I hope you check it out. And um, if you haven't seen it yet, if it should be launched by this point. I'm taking a gamble. Should I talk about it? The new Viterbi Voices website, um, as of right now, we're recording this on Friday. We're almost ready to go live. If I'm taking a gamble. If it's not live when this releases on Sunday, check it tomorrow. Um, but no earlier than Monday, the whole new kind of reorganized, rethought of voices.usc.edu website will go live. I don't know if you've seen any of it, Audrey, as they've been working on it. Yeah, I've been looking around behind the scenes a bit and it looks great. So definitely excited to, to have that the out there. Updated. I did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> new voices. I saw just today, like four new people, uh, that we've never seen or heard from before put blog posts up. So that's awesome. Uh, yeah. Super so it's cool. Going to be super cool to get a lot more voices onto Viterbi Voices. So, anyways, that's that, y'all. Uh, stay safe uh, and stay well. And if you got any questions, always feel free to reach out. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Thanks.